I've spent uh, all of my career using process philosophy, applying process thinking to topics in the sciences and social sciences and also in the arts. And I'm, I'm known within, within the field of process philosophy for doing that. There's two edited books I, I, I did called Applied Process Thought, um, which took process thinking and applied it to a range of topics in, in the sciences, for example, biology, physics, chemistry, um, but also in the arts as well. And um, this came out of my PhD, which was looking at the role of trust in small firms, the human experience of trust. And I understood even then during my PhD that trust is not a state. It tends to be conceptualized as a psychological state involving the confident expectation of one person in respect of another person's behavior in a situation entailing risk to the, to the trusting person. And I realized very quickly that that's not true. It's not a state at all. It's very much an experiential process, a dynamic relationality. And um, interestingly enough, I have a, um, a long-standing um, friend and colleague here called Denise Skinner, who's the executive dean of the so you know. And she's in trust as well. We go back a long, a long way. So I was actually at lunch with her yesterday. It was wonderful. Um, now, so the process thinking. Uh, I'm, the, the Center for Process Studies has uh, got a very interesting connection with everything ecological because of its co-founder, John B. Cobb Jr., <coughs> who is a theologian, but he's also one of the first really environmental thinkers in the States. You may have heard of him through a book called For the Common Good, which he did with Herman Daly, um, but also a book that he did in, in the 19, early 1970s called Is It Too Late? And so this talk and the paper that, that um, um, it comes from is really based very much in his thinking. And I'm very fortunate because John Cobb is in some senses my academic into my intellectual father. I'm very, very fortunate to have been able to spend time with him and work with him now. And we did a conference that I was part of the organising group for last year in California called Towards um, Ecological Civilization. And that brought 1,500 people from around the world to talk about re radically reimagining and reinventing a whole range of different um, topics and disciplines, of which one was management. I was directly related to running the management one. And this is a talk that actually um, encapsulates a lot of my thinking in this space. And it tries to say, is it possible to think of management in ecological terms? What would, if, if there is something called ecological economics, which places economic thinking within an understanding of the biosphere, rather than um, more mainstream economics when it thinks about ecological issues, um, placing the biosphere within, econo within an economic scheme, if we can think of ecological economics, is it possible to think of ecological management? In other words, a management which is turned to the biosphere. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. I'm also a, a fellow of the RAU uh, in sciences, the Royal Agricultural University in Sciences, but since this thinking is based in the work I do at the centre, that's why I put that, that tag there. Now, um, I'm very fortunate enough to, to have met and had some very wonderful conversations with somebody called Karen Higgs, who I recommend to you, and recommend her new book published by MIT Press um, called uh, Collision Course, okay, um, uh, Endless Growth on a Finite Planet. And Karen has given me permission to steal her slides. So half of this talk will be using some of her wonderful pictures, and half of it will be talking to the actual issues that I'm trying to grapple with in the paper. Okay, this is a fabulous slide. I hope that the camera can pick it up. What it does basically is it, it demonstrates that all the socioeconomic trends and all the earth system trends, if you put them in graphs, all speak to the great acceleration. They all engage in an exponential growth around about 1950. So if we're thinking about world population, exponential growth from about 1950, real GDP, exponential growth, foreign direct investment, exponential growth. All of these things, urban population, primary energy use, fertiliser consumption, large dams, water use, paper production, transportation, telecommunications, international tourism, which are all the negative effects on the planet, are all really shaped around a 1950 turn. The Earth system trends the same. And of course, the point of Johann Rockström's argument with his book, Great Transition, is to say that these effects here are directly responsible for all these effects over on the right hand side. So carbon dioxide, nitrous, nitrous oxide, methane, stratospheric ozone, surface temperature, ocean acidification, 
marine fish capture, shrimp aquaculture, coastal nitrogen, tropical forest loss, domesticated land, terrestrial biosphere degradation. There is a connection between all the things that we've been doing and all of the effects that we're seeing on the planet. Now, all the things that we've been doing, you can put, you can blame management for, or rather man's understanding of management, what we do with management. And the point of this talk is to try and explore that and try and reshape our understanding of management to be something slightly different. Okay, so on to uh, Prince Charles. I, I use this quote. Prince Charles gave a wonderful address to the graduating students at the RAU last year, and this is an extract from it. Um, that's it's actually available on YouTube. If you just put Prince Charles RAU, it'll come up, his whole address. But isn't this uh, a remarkable uh, observation? And of course, it'll ring true to you um, in this place, but uh, it's not often something that people pay too much attention to out there. All right. Uh, I put it up just because it focuses the mind. And again, the, the, the problem with management as man has practiced it is that it's management that's caused this. And it's our lack of understanding of how management is actually practiced in nature. And it's our complete weddedness to the idea of profit that is making it so difficult for Prince Charles's message to be properly understood. Okay. And my critique of management is that it's, it's, uh, it's forcing a mindset which is really problematical. Now, um, I don't need to show this next slide to you, but you, I, I will because it's a pretty picture, but it, what it does is it, is it articulates the collapse of the Newfoundland cod fishery. So in other words, everything was ticking along quite okay from about 1815, 1950, something happened just after 1950. Okay. Industrial fishing. And we fished it out. Okay. Now, as a result of massive intensification of fishing, trying to recover the fish landings, they managed to recover it for a little while, but then, of course, the whole thing collapsed to nothing. We nearly lost cod. Completely. And that is a direct, fault, uh, direct result of man's intensively intensive agriculture. And again, it's a direct fault of our of management's drive for profit, at the, with the absence of any other understanding. Okay. Um, now, my argument actually is that management is not the preserve of capital letters man. It's not the preserve of Homo sapiens. There's something more fundamental about management. It's, to my argument, and this is the process philosophy side coming in, to my argument, management is a universal feature of all purposeful life. So uh, I'll come to that in a second. Let's just, just, just draw the conclusion that our species is quietly destroying the biosphere and has been doing so at least since the 1950s, if not before then. Our species. I, I often use the idea of man as a weed. Man is a weed. Spread around the world, killing off all other um, life. Choking off life. Um, but management is not the preserve of man. And this is this is the point. Uh, if you look at an ant colony, we were talking about this over, over a coffee earlier on, Michelle and I, there are ant colonies in the, in the ground here, underground. They won't be too happy with the rain at the moment, but they're there, and they have created an environment for themselves. They have changed the structure of the soil around them to create a colony in which they live. That colony is socially, dynamically related. It's organised in particular ways. There are leaders within that colony who are communicating through pheromones and various other things, but there's leaderful activity within that colony. They have places where they go to to forage for food, and they have in their own way created and changed the, the, um, the ecology around them, changed the environment around them to create paths to get from where they live to where they feed and back again. Okay? A meerkat colony. 
much the same thing. They have created a place and changed the, changed the, the, the nature of the environment by creating out, borrowing out hollows. A, the, the, the alpha female in a meerkat colony is leading that colony and is responsible for its purposeful flourishing. Okay. Um, the other one, of course, I speak to is a, sil is a silverback gorilla in a, in a gorilla troop is leading that troop and is often occasionally has to cross people into shape okay but the purpose is to enable that troop to flourish that's management it's leadership it's management it's organization so management is not the unique preserve of man but we have forgotten that and there is something that we have done with management that is really problematical what is it about our approach to management, which means the way we use management is for excess, whereas every other species, every other purposeful life on the planet engages in that naturally occurring phenomenon management for the purpose of sustenance. Okay. Sufficiency rather than excess. In actual fact, it was Denise Skinner yesterday when I was speaking to her about this who made that connection for me. She spoke about those two words, sufficiency over excess. We practice management for excess. Every other creature, by and large, practices it for sufficiency. And what is it about us that means we have done that? And the argument that I've, I make in the paper, and the argument I've made in other places as well, is that we have created an entirely artificial commodity called money. No other creature has money. What we've done is we've created this thing so that everything is now about making money. Everything is in that commodity. So creating, creating places to live is about making money. Right? Eating is about making money. Transporting is about making money. Even procreation for, for, for large parts of Western society has somehow become about making money. Something wrong somewhere with what we have done with management. Okay. And it's inherent in our cultures, in Western culture, note. By the way, here's something I ask my philosophy of management students. What is it about Western management which means it's better than any other form of management? Even man's management. African approaches to management are being wiped out by this Westernisation. Right? What about Aboriginal approaches coming from, from Australia, from Tasmania? Aboriginal approaches to management are far more connected with the biosphere. They don't have wildfires, they know how to manage the environment, but somehow, oh, it's got to be Western management. Something wrong with the culture of our Western lives is that picture, which again is one of Kevin's um, pictures. We know, that, we know that we are living in excess. We know it, but somehow our cultures are driving us towards getting more. So we have, we're living in this contradiction all the while. Now, my argument is that there's something more powerful happening around our understanding of ourselves and our connection or disconnection to the environment, and that is a function of the way in which a particular form of science has come to dominate education and dominate the general mindset. And that science is not really science as it's practiced in places like epigenetics or, or uh, particle physics, or astrophysics, it's actually practiced in other parts of, of social sciences as well, in particular. And they're wedded to this Newtonian physics engine. So the ideas of Newton and Descartes and Kant, which are about passive, isolated, static objects. Right. That's a real problem, because it's it actually encourages in our thinking a disconnect from nature. We know that nature is about dynamic relationality, and yet the educate the scientism of the modern mindset forces us to try and live in what John Cobb has described as a great cleft. A cleft between the cleft that exists between you and I as people who have animals, pets, and we take them for walks, and we know there is a connection there. And yet when we go into the, into the lab, oftentimes we are forced by the axiology of the sciences 
to ignore that and take a cell out of its environment and put it in a petri dish and measure it and split it up and do stuff and pretend that it's exactly the same cell as it was when it was in, in its natural environment. That scientism pervades academia in higher education. And it's, it's actually, it's not just higher education, it's the education that comes before that, which means that people are disconnected from nature. So disconnecting mind from matter and man from nature is a genuine problem. Okay. And it's manifest very powerfully in management. So management uses man, homo sapiens, to improve the wealth of corporations which offer goods. How wonderfully positive that would be. Okay. For human consumption as an end in itself. There's another paper I've written with a colleague of mine, Christine Nisham at Swinburne, and we asked this question, which was actually a question posed um, to me once by the, um, the economist Brian Lowesby, um, who's the Emeritus Professor of, of Economics at Stirling in Scotland. I, I learnt my economics through him um, when I was doing a Master's in Entrepreneurship. And he asked us, hang on a minute, are all goods good? Well, the answer is no. But it's an interesting question. Okay. Human consumption. Okay. Consumption by the accrual of personal and governmental debt. It's not just personal debt, it's governmental debt. We're living in the Brexit maelstrom at the moment. Some of that is around the, is around the issue of government debt. If you look on the Daily Telegraph website, if you, um, newspaper, um, there's, there's been a wonderful schematic which shows the interweb, the interconnection of government debt to the tunes of trillions of dollars. There's something fundamentally wrong when governments are in trillions of dollars worth of debt. And our societies are now driven by debt. What's the um, credit card, average credit card debt in this country? Is it, uh, it £5,000 or £10,000? That's frightening. That's frightening. We're disconnecting ourselves from what it means to be able to flourish apart from this consumption question. And as this is my father, 91, I keep able to come back here because he's, he's fit as a flea. He said this for 10 years, capitalism is committing suicide. Right. And management is the route by which that is happening. Okay. And my argument is that it's the scientism that underpins our modern Western world that is enabling that to happen because it disconnects us. Okay. Even the word sustainability, sustainable, is incredibly problematic now. Sustainable has come to mean status quo. Oh yes, we've got to have sustainable management practices. Sustainable businesses. Sustainable businesses means businesses that will continue to be able to make profit for a long time. No, hold on a second. That's not, that's not what sustainable really is meant to mean. Yeah? Sustainable is meant to mean genuinely coexistent with the rest of nature in a way that is regenerative of nature. Not depletive of it. Okay, and um, here's another one of Karen's lovely slides. There's something wrong somewhere. All right. And capitalism is committing suicide because we're disconnecting ourselves from nature and we're, we're ignoring uh, Australia in particular, thanks to its politicians, is fundamentally ignoring the issue of, the issue of global, global climate change. Um, Tony Abbott lost his job as Prime Minister because he was openly critical and finally people said that's not on. But even, even in, the, even in the, the politics of the current general election there, um, the environment is not even discussed. Okay. But the effect might be that. Okay. If there is a 10 metre sea level rise, that will be the effect on New York. We are committing suicide. And we're committing suicide because we have lost sight of the, the impact of ourselves on the biosphere. Okay, land mammals by weight. One of Karen's slides again. There is the elephant. That little pixel there. Man's impact on the biosphere is massive. And it's also massive because of domesticated cattle. Okay. 
Now, the next slide is just pointing out that much of our thinking in the West <coughs> is driven by the power of think tanks. These quasi operating, they're non governmental organization type think tanks, um, which put a lot of pressure through the media and through the lobbying um, to argue for a particular point of view. And it's based on this observation. This observation. That the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the masses is an important element of democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. Nineteen twenty eight. Yeah. Okay. Nineteen twenty eight. All right. Um, now, the people who do that are the are the corporations which practice this form of management which is so powerful and has led to such economic growth, such profit pursued. It's an interesting question. Okay, so moving on then to really pick up this cause and effect of the end of neo-naturalism. In other words, there is another way to think about ourselves and nature. There is another way of engaging in higher education. But it is it has been lost to the disciplinization that comes with the science model, the reductionist view of nature. Nature as passive, material, mechanistic. That dominates the worldview. Life has been stripped out of biology. Somehow we've got to put life back into biology. Indeed, there's a very good book written um, or co-edited by, by a process um, colleague of mine called Adam Scarf, putting the life back into biology. Uh, if, if any of you have also read any of Charles Birch's work, the Sydney biologist, The other problem is the way in which higher education is increasingly structured around disciplines. And this is uh, John Cobb's argument, disciplinolatory. Higher education has placed the notion of a discipline on a pedestal, uncritical of the idea of disciplines and the way they work. How they separate up the world. And they separate up the world in a Descartian way. They separate up that, the world using the reductionist approach to science. Now, I'm involved in a project at the University of Tasmania called Breadth Units, which is an attempt to overcome that by bringing disciplines together to present to undergraduates in their first year central challenges of our time, so that they have an awareness of that before they go into the narrow confines of their disciplines. That's wonderful, but the research question, and we're not the only university quite to do it, but we're, we're doing it in a way which is bringing about student choice because we're trying to get 30 or 40 of these units up. However, that's a different topic for another time. But the challenge is that in research, how much of our research money is driven by discipline, discipline, I can't even say it, disciplinistic thinking among the funding bodies? How much of our research has to be driven by these narrow ways of understanding the nature of what it means to do proper research, genuine science research? Okay. The unthinking placing of disciplines on a pedestal. But you see, the problem is that the Wissenschaft think nicht. The disciplines don't think. And yet the whole purpose of, the whole responsibility we have is to engage in a value-laden understanding of ourselves in relation to everything else. But if the Wissenschaft think nicht, there's no possibility of doing that within discipline. Because the, the way in which the axiologies, the mindset of the disciplines, forces you to behave as a scientist is value-free. Value-free science research. Now, it's not actually value-free at all. The, but the only value that matters is money. I've come back to my money problem. The only value that matters is money. There's, there's a problem there. When, when vice-chancellors can veto perfectly good work because it will damage the reputation of the university in terms of its capacity to get more money, Okay. And it's all turned around a business model, a Western, a Western management model. 
it's not the vice chancellor's fault. They're trapped in a um, in an artificial game. And what I'm trying to do, in some sense, is say that management is at fault for that, and we need to rethink it. Okay. If we're ever to overcome the problems that we face, so the mode of thought that is taught in our universities encourages the man-nature separation as a result of value-free, object-focused science research in narrow discipline. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying in any way this is anybody's fault. I'm not laying the blame on anybody. I'm simply trying to make a broad observation that we need to radically rethink the way in which we engage in management to give ourselves a chance of reconnecting with that which we need to reconnect to. In order to give ourselves a chance of reconnecting all of our research to what we need to be thinking about. Okay. Uh, can we connect values in a value-free science age? And uh, fish, by the way, is not, is not, I'm not speaking about a creature, I'm speaking about a person. If you want to understand, if you want to understand the problem that universities have got, uh, this chap, if I remember rightly, was uh, a leading manager in um, it was either Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember which one. He wrote a book called Save the World on Your Own Time. You want to understand the, the problem that universities have got in trying to understand how to do things differently. That book is a good place to start. He's basically saying, you ain't hired as academics to do anything of any meaningful worth at all. You're hired to advance the knowledge in your discipline. Now, if it so happens that at the end of that, something interesting comes out of it, which is of use, that's fine, but you're not meant to do that. That's a happy byproduct. You are hired to advance the knowledge in your disciplines. How wonderful would it be if a neo-naturalist view, if, if, if the view that, that occurred, if the way in which education happened before the disciplines took, took hold in the 19... In, uh, let me think. It would have been about just after the, the First World War, the Chicago model, if that hadn't taken hold... It would be possible to do research in a way that wasn't just about narrowly advancing. Now, I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that science research is not important and not valuable. I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply trying to say that we need to take the next big step. Okay. Uh, you know, if, if universities are not about saving the world in various ways, why are they here? Um, we have a problem, and that is that major corporations are capable of spinning anything at all to be seen to be contributing to the biosphere. And here is an example. Here is um, one of those um, think tanks, Advanced Energy for Life, powered by Peabody Energy. Now, that is a wonderful marketing spin. It creates in the mind the idea that there's something wonderful going on. You're thinking about the future. You're thinking about blue skies. Okay? But it's a coal body. So what I'm arguing is that something has happened. There has been an abject failure of our management. The way in which we practice management. And, okay... One of the fundamental and most dangerous assumptions of our time is that economic growth is the universal panacea. In Australia at the moment, the only word that's ever used in the election at the moment is growth. So both parties are saying it's about growth. Growth, 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 growth. The Brexit question is fundamentally geared around economic growth. Will we prosper or will we all right, struggle as a result of Brexit in terms of GDP, in terms of economic return? Should we be, is that the right mechanism anymore to begin to think about what it means to be human and our relation to, to everything else? So as I mentioned for our common good, of course for our common good, John Carl Hogan Day was trying to find another way of getting to the issue of uh, well-being other than GDP. GDP is a wrong measure. Okay. Um, and yet, and yet, management, what I'm arguing, that, that entirely natural, the occurring phenomenon you see throughout all purposeful life, is the only means we have at our disposal for intervening in the world to actually make a difference. 
as soon as an environmental scientist chooses or, or, or gets fed up with simply measuring the degrading of the environment, simply measuring the effect of the way in which we are impacting on other species, simply gets totally fed up with all the numbers that she is measuring and decides that she wants to intervene and change what's happening, she's engaged in environmental management. There's nothing on the horizon called Unga Bunga that's going to appear to magically overtake management as the way to intervene and shape things. I have multiple cirrhosis. Um, it's one of the reasons I say that science has a very powerful role to play because if it wasn't for the science that's led to new drugs in MS, I wouldn't be standing up here today. So I'm deeply appreciative of the value of science in that respect. I'm simply saying that we need to take the next step and ask science to actually pay attention to the data it's getting through epigenetics, okay, for example, um, to appreciate the dynamic interconnectedness of things. Um, management as a practice is the only means we have at our disposal. There isn't anything else on the horizon that's going to take the place of management. But my argument is that the sort of management that we practice has to be radically different from the management that we practice today. Something radical has got to change. And what I'm trying to argue for is that approach to management is an ecological management. All right. So I've said that already. Um, here again is another slide, a couple of slides coming up, that just, just highlight the impact of management when it's practiced for profit and highlights the impact of these major, major councils, industry councils, in terms of their effect on how we, particularly in the West, that Western mode of civilization, is degrading the biosphere. Petrochemicals, have you noticed? There are other ways of fertilizing the soils. Nature has a good chance of doing that right because it's been doing it for millions of years. We've messed it up. Dean Freudenberger has said, um, what is it? There are about a hundred harvests left because of the way in which you are using petrochemical fertilizers. Okay. We've disconnected ourselves from soil. We're damaging things. And a large part of this is the power of these big councils. There's another one. Okay, number of think tanks in the world in 2013. This again is from Karen's work. Um, 2013 global think tank, 6,826, of which right, the vast majority are funded by corporations and business councils. Okay. It's just worth bearing in mind the power of management as it's presently practiced. So what is required for an ecological management? This is where the process thinking comes in. We can speak more about this if you want. But have you noticed how, how modern, modernistic science focuses on objects, focuses on passive, isolated objects? And yet, if we stop and think about the nature of things, there is a subjectivity inherent in all purposeful life that is valuable for itself. Um, Michelle and I were just, just we were having coffee over in the um, coffee shop and we were looking at birds feeding on a bird feeder. I'm just observing this notion that those birds are subjects for themselves. They have an experience for themselves, which is entirely valuable, and yet science strips that out. So, from an, for ecological management, we must appreciate the agency of subjects as active, as interrelational, the dynamic relationality of things, as purposeful for themselves. That's known as neo-naturalism, and that is the mode of thought that was written out by the disciplinisation that occurred as a result of the Chicago school's changes. Okay, and this is the point that's in the paper. Until we educate people differently, okay, until we teach them to think about management differently, so they enter the world of work with a fundamentally different set of presuppositions with which to think, then the self-destructive nature of economism cannot be meaningfully addressed. E scientism, economism. All right. Those are the two requisites. And it comes down to higher education at the end. It comes down to education more broadly. But particularly perhaps in higher education, given the massification of higher education as we see it in this day and age. All right. But 
the agency of subjects has acted as interrelational. We've somehow got to change, make a radical change to the way in which we teach people the nature of the world. Right. Here's another picture which I just think is lovely. Again, it's Peabody, this one. There's something alluring about that. Our children turn to us for a brighter energy future. And you would think that that was all about green energy. It's not. It's not. Okay. And the reason, of course, is that management as it's practiced today is turned for one purpose, the making of money. And everything else comes secondary. So the moral obligation is lost. Um, how does it go? Corporate social responsibility, CSR or business ethics. That's just spinning to create the impression that actually what corporations are largely doing is making use of being seen to be corporately socially responsible in order to make money. All right. We need to get this is Dean Freudenberg's phrase. We need to stop thinking about today not tomorrow, and get into thinking about tomorrow, not today. The irony of ironies is that Patek Philippe, the luxury watchmaker, if you heard of them, um, which are all about extracting gold and precious metals from the, from the earth and turning them to these highly valued in our Western society commodities of watches that tell the time, right? even iPhones tell the time, um, they've actually got it. They say, you never actually own a Patek Philippe, you merely look after it for future generations or for the next generation. That's true of our place in the world, that's true of what we need to do, but we've forgotten it. We, may, we, we don't own what we find ourselves surrounded by, we're only looking after it. And, um, yeah, we don't. We, don't. <laughs> we must live. Now, this is where I'm getting to when I come to ecological management. We must live within the potentials and limitations of renewable resources, not exhaustible ones. Sustainability requires living within the regenerative capacity of the biosphere. We need to turn management towards living. We need to turn our practice of management back to the more natural approach to management, which you find throughout the rest of purposeful life, towards living within the regenerative capacity of the biosphere. Even lions live within the regenerative capacity of the biosphere. The reason there's a reduction in lines is because we're killing them off, not because... Right? All right. And this is the real thing for me. Management, as we practice it, needs to contribute to the beauty, integrity and harmony of the biotic community. It's only being practiced correctly. Management is only being practiced correctly. And we see that in the natural world when the actions and contributions of those that are practicing management are turned to the beauty, integrity and harmony of the biotic community. Our, the way we practice management at the moment, it ain't doing that. My argument is that if we're doing ecological management, we are doing that. Or we need to do it, or we do need to do it, that's for sure. We need to move away from what I call three Ds to three Rs. Okay? Our communities, our human communities at the moment, are very, very fragile. They're basically founded around commuting. Have you noticed? Satellite villages and satellite towns. They're not connected to, the, they're not connected to where they are. They're not connected to place and space. They're not connected to... to um, to what's around them in the natural world. They're delicate. So the first D is delicate. The second D is dependent. Our human communities are dependent for their, for their, sustain, for, for their sustenance, for their livability on other places. They're not self-sufficient. They're not self-reliant. They're dependent. Okay? And they're degenerative. They are not contributing to the flourishing of the biosphere around them. Even in the local environment, they're just not doing that. They're destructive of it. So 
our current communities, human communities, are delicate, they're dependent, and they're degenerative. We need to move to communities that, and this is the, this is the Prince of Wales, this is Prince Charles, really. If you think back to that talk, to, to that slide I gave right at the start, where he speaks around what's needed in agriculture, he's really arguing this point. We need communities that are resilient, resourceful, and regenerative. All right. Now, the Prince of Wales speaks in the agriculture space, of course, directly to say that farming communities, as custodians of the land, in the way that they are, farmers need to reconnect with the, with the villages and communities around them. We need, farming needs to somehow reconnect people with food. Because people are totally, as my father says again, people are only interested, people, people view potatoes in the same way they view toilet paper. They're only interested in the price of it. They know they need to have them, but they're, they're totally disconnected. So of course, my argument is that comes back to the way in which modern science has just driven this wedge between ourselves and nature, because of the way it forces us to think. All right, so three Ds to three Rs. Okay, now, there is something called the Eco-Modernism Manifesto. I don't know if any of you... Is this linked up to the web? Will this work? Should have tried it before. Now I've just got to work this so it'll come... This, in some way, there's nothing actually wrong with this. But actually, when you read it and start to think about it... Um, Intensifying many human activities so they use less, here we go, intensifying many human activities so they use less land and interfere less with the natural world is the key to decoupling human development from environmental impacts. But it's not only, de it's decoupling man even further from nature. Okay. That, that argument wins political um, prizes very quickly, as you can imagine, because of course to actually grapple with the problem in a way which is radically different isn't politically palatable. Right. So I recommend it to you, and I recommend thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've had a quick couple of exchanges with Barry, and his argument is that what I'm trying to say, an eco-postmodernist view, is simply not realistic for the world we're living in. Let's think about that for a minute. Because what he means is that there's no way on earth any government will pay attention to what to what we're trying to do, because it just doesn't fall into line with the with the real politic of how things are at the moment. Yeah, they're trapped by their own worldview anyway. Exactly, exactly. They're trapped by their own worldview anyway. Okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with this in one sense. You can't avoid but to say this they're trying there's something at least they're grappling with it but when you start to read the detail of it it becomes worrying it becomes worrying okay now i've got to do the trick of getting out of this and find my can you come back up here yeah my, my apple skills are, are lost okay there it is lovely thank you so that was the eco-modernism question. I'm just pointing out, thanks so much, just pointing out there's something not quite, not quite right with it. All right, so here we go. This is John Cobb. This is um, um, a, a book he wrote in 1999, the name of which now escapes me. Uh, and it's in the paper, and I can't remember the, the, the actual source, Drat. I was thinking it was uh, for the common good, but it isn't. It's one he wrote... It was a critique of the World Bank, in fact, that he did. Um, unlike economism, which is a narrative of our individual success at the expense of the planet, the ecological narrative of Earthism is the success of, this, of the planet as a whole from which our success naturally derives. So, that's where we need to move. So, from, from management needs to be turned away from economism towards Earthism. Um... This is the conclusion I'm trying to draw. Its reason for happening, the focus of its practice, the aim of its leadership, and first and foremost, the mode of management thought from which its practice springs must be radically different to that which we still see today. And I hope I've 
try to make that as clear as I can. We need a radically different understanding of how to go about management. And that is about practicing management much more closely with the way that the rest of the species practice. And they do practice. If you ask, I mean, this is another thing. Um, management is not a science, it's an art. The way in which we study management in business studies is about turning it into science. We scientificate it in the social sciences. We measure it and we do chi-square tests and all sorts of things. Management, as it's practiced, is much more of an art. Any self-respecting silverback gorilla will tell you it's an art. <laughs> okay. In other words, you can have all the, all the data about your business that you want to have. And, all, and major corporations have got tons of data. At the end of the day, as a manager, you have to make a judgment call. And that is an art. Okay, the goal of management must now be not to deliver economy, the artificial wealth of money, but instead ecology, the natural wealth of the earth. So the actual practices of managing, the strategic thinking, okay, the way in which we engage in logistics, the way in which all these things, the actual detailed practice of it, probably will stay much the same. But, but the purpose to which it is turned needs to be radically different. Right. And that, if it's driven by an understanding of the subjective nature of experience, this, that all purposeful life has a subjective value for itself, in and of itself, then there's a possibility that our practice of management with all of our powers, can be turned to good. Okay, so, I'll just leave you with what we do now. So, economism, profit, consumerism. Oh, we must have the, 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 the most fragrant soap. We must have the, uh, the best sort of oil that we can have for whatever our uses are, and all the various um, products that we produce. Something's not right there, and it creates that picture. Okay. Um, I need to think about the contents of ecological management. Uh, or we need to think about that. We need to ask the question, does management of an ecologically positive organisation require a different management style? I think it does require a different management style. That's different from the detailed bits, the detailed practice, but the style, the whole re reordering, relocation, refocusing that needs to take place. One of the other challenges, and this is something that, uh, that a professor at the Drucker School in California, Drucker School of Management in California, um, said at the track on management that I did for the Ecological Civilization with Bruce Hansen um, of Concordia University, he said this, it isn't that the CEOs of major corporations don't understand these things because after all they have children and grandchildren too and they're just as worried as human beings as all of us are about that. The problem is that if any one of them acts in a way which is focused on the biosphere, they put themselves at an immediate disadvantage in the corporate world. Because if nobody else is doing it, they're competitively disadvantaged. And therefore, when their purpose is to maximise shareholder profit, shareholder return on investment, they cannot do it. So Vijay Seth's argument is to say what we need is legislation that levels the playing field. That really means that corporations must focus on the biosphere. And then they will. But until there is that sort of legislation that creates a playing field in which individual corporations won't be disadvantaged, it's very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. Okay. That's the point. Competitive advantage versus ecologically beneficial advantage. Are the areas of operation simply different, or is it a different way of thinking that leads to different results? It's a different way of thinking that leads to different results. Some of these, these ideas for further research, there's a chap called Dallas Hansen, who is well known as one of the founding fathers of the green management He's, uh, he's well known in, in Scandinavia, as you know the Scandinavians, who we may know the Scandinavians are quite, quite powerful in this space. His original thinking um, led a lot of that. I know Dallas because he used to work for me. I was the, I'm the former head of the School of Management at the University of Tasmania, and he was one of the um, 
employees there. He was a senior lecturer until he retired. And we were having a conversation the other day about all this. And he came up with some with, with these questions. Where do you go from here? Okay. Um, and this is his thought experiment, it's not mine. We need to just pause and reflect on the fact that it is not all doom and gloom, that the environmental activism that has been in place for so many years does have a, a positive effect. And it's his question. Um, what would have happened to the Great Barrier Reef within the last 80 years of environmental activism? Of course, you can turn it around and say, oh my God, even with environmental activism, it's a hell of a mess. Mm -hmm. you, can turn, you, you, can, you can turn it to the, to the negative. But Dallas was just trying to make the point that actually we are working in this space and we are having a positive effect, even although we might not quite see it. And, and if we ask the question, what would have happened to such and such and such and such if we hadn't been doing this? It's a, it's, it's a worthwhile just thought experiment. Okay, what would have happened to the rainforest if we hadn't been working in the way that we are? If, if, what would have happened to whatever it is? Okay, um, I'll leave you with that. Is there any questions? That's just an interesting thing. Melt water flows from the Moulin, from a large Moulin in the, in the Green and Ice Sheet. These photographs, as I say, come from Karen Higgs's collision course, which I recommend to you. That's my attempt to say not only do we need to question management and its effect, our practice of management, but it is to say that there is an alternative if we dare believe it, if we dare believe it, and suggest that it's possible to practice management in a way which is considerate, genuinely turned to the purpose and needs of the biosphere rather than just economism. Eco what is ecological management and is it possible and what would it mean? This is the first step in that direction. So. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.